Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to be talking about something that I know a lot of us wish to forget. Our exes. Now there can be lessons learned from listening about other people's horrors with crazy and awful people. Maybe you might learn something, or perhaps you'll just be terrified. Either way, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I drove all the way up here to meet with him. Long distance relationships are difficult at best, and I wanted to surprise him with a visit. Show up with a ton of food, wine, sweet kisses, and spend a week making love with my sweetheart. That was the dream. Anything he wanted to do was fine by me, so long as at the end of the day, he would have his strong arms around me again. I missed that physical closeness so much. Phone calls, emails, messages, they're all lovely, but nothing beats the close physical contact of being with the man you love. I waited until I was ten minutes away until I call him with the news, just in case he wanted to pick up the house a little bit. Maybe he might want to jump in the shower, check his funds in the bank, you know, surprise him, but not show up completely out of the blue looking needy. He sounded surprised, and not in a good way. I should have called sooner, I silently chastised myself. He always loved surprise visits dropped in on me and announced many times when we lived in the same town. He had a key to my apartment, and would come and go as he pleased. We both did, moving fluidly in and out of each other's lives. He might show up with flowers and Chinese food, or just as easily scare the shit out of me by slipping into the shower behind me, as I would blindly be soaping my hair. I was his, he was mine. No questions, no boundaries. While on the phone, I thought I heard voices in the background, but of course I assumed his kids were over for a visit, or a TV was left on. That female intuition whispers in my ear, but I shrugged it off. Sweetie, I'll be in your driveway in roughly 90 minutes or so. Are you up for an impromptu visit? I was thinking an afternoon hike today, showers together, dinner, a movie, and then spend all day together tomorrow, just snuggling up and making plans and doing nothing. What do you say? I laughed. Clothes were rustling in the background, and whispers, anxious whispers. Hun, are the kids up this weekend? We can take them swimming instead. More silence on the other end of the line, and more rustling. My heart was starting to race. My brain was automatically thinking stupid things. He answers after an uncomfortable pause. That's awesome, babe. Uh, an hour gives me just enough time to tidy up and wash a bit, do some laundry and get some groceries, and hop in the shower. That's great, though. I can't wait to see you. Kisses, love you. And he hungs up. Keep in mind, I'm really ten minutes away. Well, now less than five. There was something different about his voice. An undertone of urgency. Frustration, perhaps. Maybe these months separated by the miles had erased some sort of ease of familiarity that was ours in the city. His job temporarily pulled him into this beautiful country town in the Ozarks to work on a building project. The separation had been hard on both of us, but the financial opportunity, too fantastic to pass up. This one year assignment would bring us peace and security, a home, a bigger paycheck, a promotion, and if everything falls into place as planned, marriage and a child of our own. His kids live with his ex, but stay with him often, 
and do come visits. They've even stayed with me on occasions. I'll leave their names out though, knowing what I know now. But I love them. His young daughter just turned nine. His teenage son is already a handful of fifteen, but are both great kids. I recall that I asked him if the kids were up this weekend. I don't recall that he answered the question though. Did he? Forget the wine and fast food. I'm driving straight in. Surely I'm wrong. I need to shut that stupid woman's intuition voice down now. Not every man is like that. Certainly not Kevin. Not my Kevin. I rounded the corner, just in time to see his big, red manly pickup truck and her tiny, blue, topless mini car. I think it was a Mini Cooper. I don't know the names of the vehicles all that well. But who cares about the vehicle now? My beautiful, tan, red-headed, flawless beast of a man caught quite the picture in the early afternoon sun. He could steal any girl's breath away. Think Michael C. Hall on Dexter. Ginger, chiseled, and just a bit older. Shirtless with blue jeans. Perfect. Except for the fact that he was walking, holding hands with a beautiful young girl half his age. A girl that I had never seen before walking so very, very close. My heart caught in my throat. Should I bother to describe her? You know the type. Young, blonde, gorgeous and perfect. Tan, glowing skin, with non-stop curves. Breasts that came dangerously close to bursting out of her tight black tank top and tight jean shorts just like the ones I wore back in my sexy days. His golden retriever Heidi happily close to both, wagging tail waving high. Signs of familiarity? I was three houses down, and I slowed to watch the encounter that I didn't want to see. But I forced myself to watch, to be certain. I can't assume. This could be completely innocent. He went to whisper something in her ear, as his hand slipped down to cup her breast in his hand. Her voice rang out with musical laughter. He tossed her hair back, and his mouth found hers covering her lips to drown out her laughter in a kiss that should have been mine. A short honk behind me snapped me back to reality. I'm still on the road. I'm now an outsider looking in. A voyeur spring on something that I thought was mine. There was no anger flooding through me. No sadness. I didn't have a tear in my eye. I don't think I could cry at that moment if someone had paid me to perform the actions of a betrayed fiancé. Nothing but an icy numbness, as if glacial waters had begun to seep through my veins. A second honk. Both of their heads swiveled towards me. To question, this car paused just a few houses down that is now blocking traffic. I'm not prepared to deal with this just yet. I'm sure he didn't recognize me. I ease on the gas and move past their questioning looks. He half turns to watch me drive away, as if on some level he half suspects that it might have been me. Yeah, that wasn't his niece. No explanation needed. I'm on these soft pillows, letting the cool air of the hotel rush over me. I've slept a few hours. I entertained the idea of listening to his lies. The confrontation. More lies. It would be lies, wouldn't it? After all, if he was going to end our relationship, telling me would have been the decent thing to do. That should have happened well before this point. No. This is deceit, pure and simple. He wanted his little fling, and it seemed to me perhaps it had been going on more than a few days. I don't know. It doesn't matter at this point. I've decided 
that it isn't worth the drama or investing any more time. Surprising, really, how fast five years of feelings for someone, all that invested time and emotion, can turn into cold ice after witnessing a betrayal. I shouldn't have checked my messages. 42 from him. Voice, text, missed phone calls. Where are you? Are you okay? Did you decide to get a hotel instead, honey? Please let me know. I can't wait to see you, baby. I'm waiting for you. That last message included a picture of himself under the bed. The covers obviously supporting a massive erection. Yeah. I'm not sure how many places that thing's been now. I prefer being single to sharing. She can have him. If he would cheat easily on me, she will find herself in the same situation soon enough. I'm going back to sleep now. 47 messages. I need sleep more than drama. I push the delete button on my phone, blocking his number and blocking him from my life. That was the last thing that I read from my sister. I was cleaning out my sister's files on her computer and I found what you just heard. I am the one sitting here stunned now. We're going through her belongings deciding what to keep and what family mementos are of our precious Connie we want to give to charity. She may not have been able to cry but I'm bawling my eyes out after what I've just heard. That bastard. She called me on her way home as she left the Ozarks. She never said a word. God damn you, Kevin. She talked as she drove, talking about gardening on her week off. Instead, since Kevin had been called to work. Barely mentioned him, in fact. She told me twice that she loved me, and she never does that. She's always so reserved with her emotions, our Connie. A hug, a sweet smile. That's about all the emotional sharing we could expect. The rental car company called us because she was late, and we'd been trying to reach her for at least three days at that point. Kevin was actually the one that tipped us off that something was wrong said she never made it to his house. So unlike her to not respond to her messages. And he had left hundreds. We all had. Searcy County, Arkansas Sheriff's Department found her car at the bottom of a very steep cliff, several hundred feet straight down a rocky embankment, well hidden in the pine trees. There were no skid marks. It was assumed that perhaps she had swerved to hit a deer and gone right off into the abyss. Were it not for the rental car's reverse location pinpoint system, she may not have been found for much longer. It wasn't pretty. I didn't have to view her body, but my parents did. They said animals had gotten in through the smashed windows and eaten much of her face. Her eyes were gone, but that grimace of a smile was beyond horrible. Her lips were gone. The paperwork reads something like vehicular death, accident, traumatic injury. My parents have copies, but I don't want to read them. It comforts me that her skull was crushed on impact and that she didn't suffer. But now, sitting here with her laptop in my hand reading this, this event that occurred between she and Kevin, I can't help but wonder. She may not have suffered physically from the impact, but I believe her soul was crushed from the betrayal. Did she mean to send this? Were we meant to find this later in order to gain some understanding of it all? My dear sweet sister, my heart breaks for you now, even though you are long past feeling anything. Rest in peace, darling sister. Rest in peace. In high school, I wasn't very popular. I was usually on my own, or with one other person, and one day, 
I noticed this guy by himself. For a few months, I kept seeing him around school, and he was always alone. I sit next to him one day, and we start talking. We quickly become good friends, and I notice he's a little quirky, but I excuse that. Turns out he has Asperger's syndrome and autism. I didn't really care because I kind of dug his weird sense of humor. It was kind of dry. He was appealing in an odd way, but he played the guitar like a god. He was a better musician than any I had ever seen or heard. He could play any song by ear and create melodies out of his head like a wizard. Despite the beautiful music he could make, he listened to a lot of Cannibal Corpse and such music. He kept a journal of metal songs he wrote. A lot of them were violent and just horrifying. But again, I turned a blind eye, because I assumed it was just the genre. The more we hang out, the more he opens up and begins to flirt with me. Eventually, we start dating, and things are great for a few months. Then he becomes obsessed with me cheating on him. I was dating someone else when we first met, so he was paranoid that I had two timed. He would get panicked when I didn't call or text, and proceeded to bitch at me with angry Facebook statuses and emails. I put up with it for a year, then things got really bad. He began to write songs about me, horrible, gory songs, about how I would die being tortured and raped. He would slit me like a pig. And pull out my fertile uterus, and burn my fetus. It was just rambled violence that really didn't make any sense, and they were scratchy illustrations to go with the song, like fake album covers. I was growing more and more terrified. His temper began to escalate, and soon he went from being this sweet boy to a horrid thing. He would get angry when I wouldn't want to perform oral on him all the time. He claimed I was his, and it wasn't up to me. He began to criticize my looks and personality. He started to become more sexually aggressive, to the point of him hitting me and holding me down while he tried to touch me. My parents would ask about the bruises, and I'd give excuses. Like something happened in sport or whatever, I'd break up with him. I need cry and come over, begging me to take him back. Being the little brainwashed pushover I was, I would. The last straw was when he was at my house and we were watching a movie. He was being sweet again. He was holding me, kissing the top of my head, and came to kiss my lips. And I absent-mindedly put my hand on his cheek. He flipped out, grabbed my shoulder so hard, and they left perfect hand-shaped bruises. He just looked at me, and something was very wrong with his eyes. It's like no one was home. I threatened to call the police, and he just woke up, and yelled at me some more, and began trying to intimidate me. But I held my ground. And after he was done shoving me, he ran off. He then began walking by my house at random times. It's not like it's on his walk. His house is on the opposite side of town as mine. He still calls every once in a while, but I don't answer. The walk by stopped after graduation, when I threatened to call the authorities and press charges. He broke down at graduation, saying he did the things he did because he was institutionalized so many times when he was a child, and they treated him awfully. He says he had sex with his cousin when they were young, and that made him need me more, because if he had me, 
then he wouldn't have bad thoughts. He tells me he burnt everything I've ever given him. At this point, I, as well as everyone we knew, were positive he was out of his mind. I've only seen him twice since then. Both times he was watching me, and I pretended to be making a phone call when he ran off. We have security cameras now, just in case he ever makes another move. I hope that he gets the care he needs. My wife and I met at 25. We dated, drifted, and hooked up the next year when I was 28. From what I understood, good home, parents were together, went to a local university, and had decent jobs. Basically, everything was going positive in her life as well as mine. We dated for about five years and moved in with one another. Her place was closer to her family, but further from everything else in our lives. Not a hard commute, but it started taking its strain on me. She then moved to my house, cutting her commute to a factory in half and saving me on driving around all across the countryside. Also, it should be noted that it was my father's house who he had given us free rain and rent and we just needed to pay for what we used. Being that this house was in the middle of a city with a hundred thousand people, there's not a lot of room for my cars. I have a few projects that I like to work on. My collection is housed at our family farm, about ten minutes away from where we were living. So naturally, I would be out working on cars at my family's place. Not far, not scary. But sometime in March of 2010 or so, we had gotten into a fight, which in my mind, started it all off. She complained that she didn't want to be a kept wife, and had issues with being around the house, in a different city, all alone. Which I can kind of relate to. But it bothered me that when I would go and see my family or work on my passions, that it wasn't about me. It was about how I was being inconsiderate for her. Mind you, this is also a woman who, from arriving home from her factory job, would proceed to peel out of her clothes and leave them on the floor and leave the dirty dishes for me to do, etc. Well. Some time went on, and she had asked about having some friends over. I didn't think much about it, until her friend she had brought over this guy. Well, whatever. But things began to get more and more weird between the two. He'd be staying over on my couch almost the entire weekend. She would leave to go on LARP, live action roleplay for those of you who don't know, and wouldn't bother messaging me the entire weekend. Also, it needs to be mentioned that this guy had no job, his family disliked him, and basically had no real prospects. And, well, in my eyes, wasn't much to look at, and wasn't very big, except for his occasional garish manner of dress. Clothes make the man, I suppose. So, as time goes on, I've come home to them cuddling, watching a movie on my couch. Him sitting beside her in my room while she was in bed. Things seemed pretty messed up and weird, and I was sure there was something going on. She had, at the time, brought up the idea of being in an open relationship. She had a book called The Ethical Slut, how a self-help book about relationships with other people other than your spouse can help, is beyond. It wasn't just that though. I know the picture I've painted doesn't sound like we spent that much time together, but believe you me, we used to. We loved doing all kinds of things together, having interesting and deep conversations deep into the night. But did any of that happen anymore? No. And it was very clear to see that it was all because of this character that had entered my life. I wasn't enjoying it. 
I felt like I was the one who was kept. I played the role of a domestic slave husband, doing laundry, washing dishes, vacuuming while she was either at work or out with her friend, and felt completely neglected, like she had just chosen to forget me, that I wasn't part of her life anymore. Some time goes on, and she said that her friend had went up to a retreat with his parents. Good riddance, I thought. I thought wrong. She had then went up to rescue him, and was gone for quite some time. Late into the evening, and much later, mind you, they returned home. I'll spare you what happened here, but I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. And about three to four weeks later, she claims she's pregnant with our child, but didn't tell me tells my cousin and a few others. I was actually fourth to hear. Glad my spouse can tell me everything, right? Well, there's something that you need to know about that. Since everything had started going on, we hadn't actually done it. I mean, feeling incredibly insecure and threatened, why would you? So I started piecing together some shit. She never spends time with her husband always spends time with this douchebag, who won't piss off on his own will, and wants to have an open relationship when our prior dating doesn't permit for that? I tried talking to her about everything, but every time I did, she avoided it, deflected it, or turned it around on me. So I called her paternity into question. I called her love into question. I called her commitment into question. I had to. I'd now felt like I was the kept spouse. She had once said that she didn't want me to be a jealous boyfriend or husband. But why? If she didn't want that, why would she perform the actions that would elicit that response? I had a breakdown. My family informed her family. So what if I outed her? It was about me and my strength from a weak place. I wasn't going to be treated like second best. She did not deserve the respect, dedication, and commitment I was willing to provide for her. We had separated in September 2012. Our marriage lasted 13 months, and there was no time when or where she wanted to talk about it, or even give me the time to rectify the situation. Granted, I was always the one to fix the things that were wrong in our relationship. Every fight, I found a solution. At one point, she went to the mall parking lot to wait for me at five on a Sunday afternoon, but claimed that she was waiting for hours and was going home. What is so important about Sunday afternoon at five that you couldn't have waited for a serious discussion with your husband? About a week or so later, instead of talking to me, my father-in-law said that she had hit something with her car and needed her winter tires from the garage. At that point, I knew a set of winter tyres were more important than her, than fixing her marriage. I knew exactly how important I was, when no longer than two weeks after separating, I found out that she had won, purchased a new house near her parents, and two. I went to use my tablet, which she had lent to her friend, he saved his passwords into my tablet, and when I checked my emails, saw her tits in his email on my tablet, basically saying, it's late, I want to come over. Over the course of the last year, I'd been to counselling appointments, psychiatric appointments, lawyer visits, lab visits, everything. The doctor said I had severe depression. The lawyer said I have to be separated for a year before filing for divorce, and we had requested paternity instead of having it court decided, figuring that she would also like to know who the real father is. But we already knew that, didn't we? Well, it's been quite some time now. I hadn't heard hide nor hair from her. I'd been in contact with her through my lawyer, and my family made contact hers once in a blue moon. But it seems like she's not overly concerned with finding out the truth. I think I can successfully say that I should thank her for instilling such an animosity and distrust towards all women in me. 
I don't know, and probably won't know, if I ever want to be married again. The first time was such a nightmare, and a lot of experiences I wanted to have were ripped away from me. Her craziness basically ruined me. If she really loved another, I would have given her the freedom to leave willingly. I loved her that much. All I can presume is that she didn't have the balls to either break it off on her own or leave willingly. But she had the balls to lie and cheat her way to what she wanted. I guess some people are just so selfish that they're used to walking over people to get what they want. You figure you know someone for years and this is what happens when they want something more than you. Still hurts. And for those of you wondering, yeah, the child wasn't mine. My crazy ex story involves someone I fell too hard for. I spoiled her rotten for six months with no reciprocation from her. Her name was Jill. I admit she used me good and I was partially to blame for not standing up for myself. It was a toxic relationship and she burned me good. After the relationship, I hit a really rough time in my life. At the end of said relationship was the trigger. Living with her brother for the following year didn't help either. But being away from her and still being good friends with one of her mutual friends, I got to really see and hear stories about how batshit crazy she was. The mutual friend in question, Bonnie. Most of the stories after our relationship came from Bonnie, who now hated Jill as much as I do. We'll start with some background. She was engaged to the guy before me. She had brought up marriage early in our six month relationship. And naive young Tuckernuts was totally down for that. We break up the same day, she buys me a neat 400 watt solid state guitar amp at a garage sale. Two weeks after we break up, she's with a new guy. He's also a friend of Bonnie's. He falls hard for her just as I did. And just as the guy before me did, Jill was heading into the Air Force, scheduled for basic like 10 weeks into her new relationship. In this span of time, she had broken this other guy like she did me. She was ready to move across the country to be with her. She writes him letters and stuff, and when she's graduating from basic, he rides with her family from Oklahoma to San Antonio, then breaks up with him while he's there. So he gets a nice, depressing six-hour car ride with her family back home. Not one month later, 30 days, or four weeks, she's married to a new guy, also in the Air Force. I found out about this directly from her, the last time I spoke to her. Keep in mind, this isn't even six months from the end of my relationship with Jill. On the surface, it seems like a marriage of convenience, so they can be stationed together or whatever. Five months later, she files for divorce. I hear the reasons which were, he started yelling at her. Again, not important. Not sure what happens next, but I know that after 18 months in the Air Force, she gets out. Not sure why, not sure how, but I do hear from Bonnie that she found another guy and after four months she got engaged. So now she starts her second marriage, and that lasts a whole nine months. This time, he files for divorce, and she is totally devastated, or so I'm told. Two divorces before her 24th birthday. Now I won't pretend that she didn't get to me, because she did. It hurt, and took me over a year to sort out my emotions. Now what I finally took from this is a basic philosophy. Respect is given until lost. 
Trust is earned, and most importantly, to know myself and embrace what I'm feeling instead of telling myself it's not important. When I was 18, I had barely ever dated anyone. I guess I wasn't particularly attractive in high school, but man, once I graduated high school, I couldn't keep the ladies away. That being said, I didn't just take to the first one to come along. I was choosy. I found one that was extremely attractive and seemed rather intelligent and sweet. Well, intelligent. Not really sweet. Not in the least, actually. About a month into our relationship, she started with the dreams. We'd be sleeping in bed together, and she'd start moaning, screaming. No, no, no. Stop. She'd thrash and kick and freak out. I asked her about two or three times, and she finally decided to tell me that she was raped and had flashbacks about it. Fair enough, I understand. It was traumatic. Here's the thing, though. It didn't happen. She was never raped. Her mother one time explained to me that this was something that she did for attention. The whole dreams thing wasn't real. She wasn't actually dreaming. She was laying there pretending to be asleep. Pretending to have nightmares. I'm sure people are asking themselves, Well, how do you know this? Maybe they were real. Maybe something happened her mum didn't know about. You had to be there. That's the only way I know how to put it. You could look at this girl to tell she was putting it on. It was actually almost laughable. Thing is, she would fall asleep at other people's houses, where other people could hear her, and she would never do it. Ever. She only did it round me, and often. Then things started getting weirder. I went to high-five her once, and she fell to the floor and curled into a little ball and started acting like she was sobbing. Told me she was afraid I was going to beat and rape her. Then, the sexual relationship started getting weird. Right in the middle, she'd just start crying and screaming. But tell me to stop. Say shit like, it's okay if you want to rape me. Just do it. I'd always stop and just go home. One night, when I was basically at my breaking point, she acts like she wants it. I tell her no, and I go to sleep. I wake up the next morning, and she tells me that I woke up in the middle of the night and beat her. I kid you not. She says that I woke up, pulled her out of bed, and beat her up. I've never hit a woman. I'm married now, and my wife would laugh at you in the face if you ever asked her if I hit her. Furthermore, to my knowledge, I have never, ever blacked out and done anything like that. I have a pretty good head on my shoulders. I told her she was insane and left. She banged her head against the wall a few times and then took pics and put them on my space. It was a thing back then. She called all my friends and told them I'd beat her. My friends, knowing me, all laughed, ridiculing her. It literally took three years to get her to stop calling, texting, and writing me letters. A few months before my now wife, back then fiance, got married, she answered the phone for me while I was gone and said that if she ever tried to contact her or me again, she would give her an actual reason to have PTSD. Never heard from her since. I was in high school, and I was at a friend's house party. We were having a really good time. We were all dancing and drinking and generally enjoying the company and atmosphere. 
That is, of course, until my girlfriend had one too many. And then one too many became five too many and got belligerently drunk. And at that point, I was struggling to enjoy myself because I was barely buzzed and she was being annoying. She was following me around the house, acting all sloppy and drunk, almost as if she were faking it. But what could you do? She wouldn't stop talking about how horny she was, and I just want her to pass out. But she's having none of it, and won't take no for an answer. We go upstairs into a bedroom and start hooking up. She throws me onto the floor, gets me undressed like Jim Carrey on Bruce Almighty, and turns off the lights. She rips off my clothes, straddles me, and says, You're gonna love this shit. As she lowers down, it doesn't even feel good. She makes all these noises like a savage, but there's just too much friction. I wasn't feeling it and I'm about to tell her to get off me. Then, she lets out a noise that sounds like a combination of a deep cough and a hiccup. I'm like, babe, are you all right? And she lets out a Hurricane Katrina style, levee smasher storm of explosive diarrhea all over me. Apparently, we had been going up the back passage, and she lost control. So here I am, covered in Jaeger bombs, Taco Bell, and oppressive feces, while in my friend's little brother's room. It was traumatizing. It was literally the scariest shit I had ever seen. Luckily, everyone else was downstairs. I cleaned myself off with my undershirt and walked into the upstairs bathroom to find cleaning supplies. There was Resolve and Febreze there, and I took those to the room and did the old pat down and scrub. Most of it came off right away. The carpet was this ugly greyish colour, which made things a lot easier. I put my undershirt and her shirt we used to scrub in a plastic bag that I found in the bedroom. I popped the screen out of the window and threw it into the backyard. The coast was clear in the bedroom, except for this putrid smell of rotten whale blubber. I left the window open and basically sprayed the whole bottle of Febreze everywhere, like I was a hitman cleaner. We walked downstairs. I told my friend that my girlfriend threw up in the room and that he shouldn't let anyone go in there tonight before it airs out. He wasn't thrilled, obviously. It's not like he thanked me for cleaning it up, but he wasn't a dick about it. Throwing up happens at school parties. We walk outside and got into the car and I drove into the street adjacent to his house. I walked in between houses to get to his backyard, popped his fence and retrieved the bag of deceit, sorrow, and teen anguish. I drove her home. And, as things turned out, I ended up having to apologize to my girlfriend, since she didn't have a good time. I was a bitch back then, and didn't stand up for myself, and always felt like I had to do everything right, and whenever something went wrong, even if it was her fault, it was actually my fault. I was young and dumb. Stand up for yourself, guys. Don't be bitches. You're always taking shit if you are. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I just want to say a few words. It's never okay to be in an abusive relationship. There is never a reason for anyone to hit you. So don't accept it. Ever. I've left some numbers in the description that you can call to seek help if you are in this situation. Remember, don't accept it. I wouldn't. Why should you? So now after that, 
I would like to say I really do hope that you enjoyed the video. That bonus story, I was actually saving it for a future poop video, but it just fit quite well and I thought I'd throw it in here for some light-hearted Saturday night humour to end the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like, dropping a comment as they go a long way. And don't forget to subscribe and press the little bell icon. I do upload every night so that there are always fresh horrors waiting for you. So remember to come back tomorrow. If there's a story that you would like to share, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, both of which can be found in the description. But anyway, for now guys, I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.